Lord Jesus, to know you, to be known by you, to be loved by you, to be counted as your people is the highest of privileges. There's nothing that we could compare to the inestimable value of knowing you, the surpassing greatness of being yours. We long for the day when we will see you in all of your unveiled glory, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you indeed are Lord. Lord, we groan here, even as creation groans, longing for the culmination of your plans. We groan here under a world that strains against you, whose God is your great enemy. We groan here with the residual depravity of sin's presence in our thoughts, our motives, our deeds. And yet we as your children, citizens of heaven, purchased by your blood, are new creatures. And we are not yet what we will be, but we were not what we were. You have justified, you have forgiven, you have cleansed for all time, and you are making us more like your son. These things are too great, too high for us, and we praise you for them. We ask this morning that you would use your word by the power of your spirit in our lives to make us more like your son, to give us a a valuing of those things that are eternal, that we might live according to your purposes for your glory and for our good. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn to the book of Romans and the 12th chapter as we continue our study of this great letter. We were introduced back in Romans chapter 5 to the reign of grace, that glorious tyranny of the dominion of God's undeserved favor and kindness to us who believe. And we're reminded that the Christian life is not the reception of a get out of hell free card as if we are simply forgiven and then we go about our business. But the grace in which we now stand is a reign, a dominion. We are slaves of righteousness and slaves of Christ. And if slavery sounds like a bad thing to you, you need to know that this slavery in Christ is a glorious freedom from the slavery and tyranny of sin and death and destruction. That old slave master only wanted you destroyed, wanted everything precious removed, and eventually wanted your very life. This Christ, our Lord, gave his life for ours, that we might have true freedom, that we might have true life. And we are under this reign of grace, Romans 1 through 11 has been an explanation of the gospel, of the gospel of God's grace whereby God forgives sinners, and the only way that sinners can be forgiven by the death of the substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ, hanging on a cross, absorbing the full wrath of God so that we might be declared righteous. And what unfolds from Romans 12 onward is the unfolding of that reign of grace in flesh and blood. What does the gospel look like when it is transforming a life? When the gospel has taken root in the heart and those roots begin to bear fruit in a life, that is Romans 12 and following. The reign of grace in flesh and blood. It answers for us the question, how do I live the Christian life? And we'll see this unfolded in the following chapters. Read with me again Romans 12, 1 and 2. These are the summary statements of all that follows. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
this reign of grace in flesh and blood produces a life of worship carried out in these two summary commands, worship God and dedication. We looked at that one last week. And this morning, worship God in transformation. We'll be zeroing in on verse 2. You remember from verse 1, this idea of presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, this dedication, presenting ourselves to God, it involves a significant transformation. You just will not be the same. You will not be what you were. There was a death to self when you came to Christ, and you are now a new creature, and there is a continual process of dying to self in the Christian life you are being progressively conformed to the image of Christ. That is what is detailed for us in this second summary command. Worship God in transformation. Notice what Paul says in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. There are in Romans 12 too, two commands and an outcome. Uh, Or a prohibition, that's a negative command, a positive command, an exhortation, and then a result. And all of these are the life of worship. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. These, by the way, are passive commands. Uh, That's an interesting thing to be commanded to have something be done to you. Or to be commanded to not let something else be done to you. That is the nature of both of the commands in this verse. We are to not have something done to us, and we are to have something else done to us. Let's look at that negative command first, a prohibition. Do not be conformed to this world. Not conformed. This idea of, of not being conformed is the same word that shows up in 1 Peter 1.14, Peter there says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. In other words, there is something akin to the old life which desires to exert influence on your present life. Do not be conformed to those things. To be conformed is to be squeezed into the mold of something. If you've ever worked with cake pans, bunt pans, angel food cakes, uh, I grew up with a cake pan that was shaped like a fish, so we had lots of fish-shaped cakes. Right? It's not inherent in the cake batter to form a fish. That form is created by the mold into which it is poured. And the command here, or the prohibition is, do not be conformed, do not be squeezed into the mold of this world. Uh, Literally, the Greek word is eon, this age. Uh, Do not be squeezed into the form of this present age. The same word is used in Galatians 1.4. Jesus gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. What is this world that Paul is referring to? It is this present evil age from which we have been rescued. The God of this world, lowercase g, is none other than Satan himself. The world from which we have been rescued is a a world of ideas, worldviews, perspectives, priorities, goals, and ambitions which are passing away, which are at enmity with God. They are the life you lived before you knew Christ. And you have been rescued from that world and from all that it entails. In fact, we are commanded, do not love the world or the things of the world. And here in Romans 12, 2, the command is, do not be squeezed into into its mold. The idea here is one of external pressure that shapes you contrary to your identity, Christian. You're not what you used to be. You are something new. You are a new creation in the gospel. And yet the world around you seeks to squeeze you into a shape that is not that, a shape that is not your true life, not your true identity. 
uh, attempting to make you outwardly appear contrary to what you are. And the, the root word involved here is where we get our English word scheme. Uh, to be molded into the scheme or the outward charade of what this world's shape is. Something of a masquerade. A Christian's true identity is, is sort of invisible. It is to manifest itself outwardly, but to the degree to which we are squeezed into the mold of this world, we resemble more the world rather than what is actually true of a believer. And this external scheme, this mold that is constantly exerting pressure upon the Christian life is a mold of that which is temporal, transitory, short-sighted. It is the world's plans and goals and ambitions determined by life here and now, governed by the God of this world. Things like, you need to look out for number one. That is a mantra of a worldly worldview rather than a biblical one. Unless, of course, the number one you have in mind is God in all of his glory. You've heard the mantra, he who dies with the most toys wins. That is a worldly mantra that is always exerting its external pressure upon us, seeking to conform us to that shape. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, the temporal mindset of pleasure now. All of these worldview ideas are under the spell of Satan. They are enemies of the cross. They are at enmity with God. They are wrapped up in temporal things. Listen to how Paul describes this in Philippians 3.20. And he's talking here about world-shaped infiltrators into the church in Philippians 3. And he describes them this way. Many walk of whom I've often told you, and I now tell you even weeping, Philippians 3.18, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. That is, they're opposed to the shame and the suffering that is wrapped up in identifying yourself with a crucified Messiah. But their end is destruction. Their God, their true God, is their appetite. Their glory is in their shame. They set their minds on earthly things. By contrast, Christian, Philippians 3.20, we are citizens of heaven. Your home is a place you've never yet been, but it dictates your identity and your priorities, your loves, your pursuits. Remember that this command or this prohibition in Romans 12.2, do not be conformed, is a passive command. In other words, you don't have to be actively in pursuit of the world to start to look like the world. All you have to do is sit there. <laughs> to be in cruise control, to just simply walk around, it is inevitable that you will be squeezed into the mold of this world. The world is actively trying to squeeze you into that, into that world. And when we are simply passive, when we're not on the alert, when we are not involved in active resistance to this external pressure, then we yield to the world's active pressure to conform. If you're not thinking, you will accommodate the world's intrusions. We will begin to think like the world around us, act like the world around us, dress like the world around us, do what everybody else does. And listen, doing what everybody else does is so old. <laughs> when you're in junior high, you think that's the thing. And when you're middle-aged, you still think that's the thing. <laughs> Will we grow up and recognize that being like those around us isn't all it's cracked up to be? And while the world does this circular pat on the back, I'm okay, you're okay, right? What we're chasing is good. It's going to satisfy, right? If we just go around one more corner, we're all going to find what we're looking for, right? As everybody's scrambling from one thing to another to another in a godless pursuit of what might give life joy, peace, pleasure. And it's all the world can do. But the Christian life is a counterculture life. 
It is a life of active resistance, a life under the reign of grace dedicated to God is actually at enmity with this external pressure to conform that comes at us from the world. How does the world squeeze us into its mold? How do the priorities of this present age infiltrate our thinking, our living? I just want to think of a, of a few ways, and, and, and if we brainstorm together, we could come up with dozens of ways each one of us are affected by this pressure, this principle. But I want you to just think in a general principle at first that if the Christian loses Christian flavor, because the Christian is enticed to look like the world, think like the world, act like the world, what is at stake in that conformity and accommodation? The very power of the gospel itself is at stake. If Christians cease to look like Christians in the world, what message could the world possibly want from us? And that's contrary to the way we think. We start to think, how am I going to reach the world for Christ? I know. Be like them so they can relate. That's a very attractive scheme for us. And, and we begin to accommodate and to think, how can I look more like the world so that the gospel's less offensive, less confrontational, so that the Christian life is less weird, so that the world will feel more comfortable entertaining the idea of being a Christian. But as soon as you do that, you have eviscerated the Christian message. What are you offering to the world but a cheap imitation of the world? It, it actually does not sell. The only thing you accomplish with that strategy as a believer is personal compromise, a watering down of the transformative power and message of the gospel itself. And you have actually abandoned the world to its own dead, deadly priorities. You've left the world without hope. The Christian message is a countercultural message, and the Christian life is that message lived out in flesh and blood. To, to tell the world, hey, I'm just like you. Come over and buy what I'm selling. You've eliminated the need. But to tell people who are tired of the hamster wheel of the emptiness of life, to tell people who are burdened by their sin and have no hope of unburdening their consciences, to tell them that there is new life in Christ, forgiveness of sin, and a reign of grace, that is the message that saves. And that is the message we must continue to proclaim. And what we're tempted to do in terms of compromise and accommodation at the individual level, the church has done at the corporate level. And listen, when the church loses its uniqueness by trying to look like the world, what a tragedy that is for the watching world. That the church has, in the 20th century, by and large, adopted an evangelistic strategy of worldliness. Let's find out every which way we can be squeezed into the pattern of this world so the world will feel comfortable among us. Then we can reach them. Again, as a church, reach them with what? Only a cheap imitation of the things they already love. When what they need is repentance. What they need is life. And whom they need is Christ. And what is prohibited for the individual Christian has actually become the acceptable marketing technique for the ministry of the church. What a tragedy. There's another way that we succumb to the external pressure of conformity to the world, and it is the normalization of sin. The normalization of sin. Listen, it, the more sin has become broadcast in, in our present 21st century American culture, uh, where leave it to beaver would never get airtime, <laughs> although there is a resurgence of Little House on the Prairie. Everybody seems to be watching that. There is a provocation of illicit desires made public 
and normalized such that we lose our sensitivity to that which is shockingly and shamefully displeasing to God. Everything from gender identity to sexual ethics to financial ethics to work ethic. I mean, every way that you can conceive of biblical categories of sin, the world has screamed out, we're tired of your Puritan ethic, Christians. Puritan has now become a bad word. Crazy. We're tired of you telling us how to live. The very ways you want to live, Christians, is an offense to us. Don't push your morality on us. And the really tragic reality is that Christianity has bought into the world's labels for sin. To neutralize it as sin. To normalize sinful behavior. Oh yeah, listen, everybody does that. It must be okay. And Christians have bought into these things so that the church and individual Christians no longer look like lives under the reign of grace, but look like lives still at enmity with God, still in love with former lusts, still ruled by the God of this world. We forget the shock, we lower the standard. We forget the cost at which our sins were forgiven. And we slow down the fight against sin. Obedience to commands in this chapter or the urging of obedience to commands in this chapter is now labeled in Protestant evangelical Christianity legalism. What a tragedy. Legalism is sin that God hates. Obedience to God's commands is not. But we have been so shaped by this world, which recoils at God's regulating a life, that we've imbibed its vocabulary, imbibed its revulsion. Listen, legalism is attempting to merit your way to God by what you do. That's sin. God hates it. The only result of legalism is eternal destruction in the lake of fire. And oftentimes what comes with a legalistic bent, besides trying to pull yourself up by your own moral bootstraps, is the judgment of others who don't live up to your standards that you yourself can't keep. That's wicked. But a humble, dependent, reverent faith that says, God, I trust you in your ways and whatever your word says I want to do. It's not legalism. Jesus defines that as love. And what has the church done? Oh, yeah, obedience is harsh. And they've taken worldly ideas and renamed biblical truth as evil. And called what is evil good. Think about our our present culture of entitlement. I'm entitled to pleasure. I'm entitled to live for myself. Listen, McDonald's is only trying to sell you hamburgers. When it says, you deserve a break today. But they are pushing a worldview. Burger King did this years ago. I I couldn't find a single restaurant that would sell me a hamburger without goopy condiments. Burger King, have it your way. I could guarantee a successful encounter at the Burger King counter because I could get my burger my way. But that has become the mantra for life. Have it your way. What happens when 7 billion people try to have the world their way? (laughs) And yet we still lift up this mantra as the way to live. Self-absorption. Entitlement. 
Listen, the, the, the curmudgeons in this room decry the entitlement millennials that are growing up right behind us. We created that. We, did I just say we? My, I don't know which category I'm in. I'm like, <laughs> you curmudgeons created that millennial world. I'm not either one. <laughs> we have created a society where it is not only acceptable to love self above all things, but it is considered psychological disease if you do not. That is world. We have become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We value temporal things over eternal things. It is all about my glory instead of God's glory. And listen, there are many, many, many ways that we have imbibed worldly thinking that you and I here this morning do not even realize. We've been squeezed into molds we're not aware of. If we could see it, we should shed it. Sometimes it takes going outside of 21st century American culture to see it. What is the gospel going to look like in Maui Roro? When, when they do not have all the, all the ways of American compromise to deal with, but Bible's open, fresh start, what will the gospel do in that culture? Listen, it's going to have to overturn a lot of things in their culture. But we pray they don't become like us. May they be transformed progressively into the image of Christ as a people under the word of God. Sometimes it takes going outside of our culture to see the ways we've compromised. And I think one of the most helpful ways to begin to see it is to read outside of your century. Read outside of your century. This is a plug for the book table. It's hard to see our blind spots on this. The prohibition, the negative command, do not be squeezed into the mold. Positively, Paul says, but be transformed. And while that prohibition was a prohibition against the external pressure to shape you contrary to your identity... This positive command in verse 2 indicates a transformative process that progressively reveals what you truly are. That what's declared of you and what will one day be so obviously manifest of you and what is true of you in seed form internally from the heart, that that would begin to show on the outside. To take on outward expression that which is intrinsically true of you. Have you spent time with the earthworms and the grubs and the caterpillars and the centipedes and the slugs? Do you know them? Not a lot of head nodding. You're like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Listen, those are low, slimy, slow creatures that eat dirt or chew up your favorite garden vegetables. I'll never forget when I walked out and my artichoke plant was that high and then it was on the ground because a slug had eaten it at the stem. Oh, can't stand those things. One of those earthbound creatures I just mentioned is a misfit. Its true identity is yet to be seen. Its final characteristics lay hidden under a slow, grimy, terrestrial, wormish form. But the caterpillar was destined to be transformed. He will not always be earthbound. He will not always resemble the slugs and the centipedes and the earthworms he used to commiserate with in the dirt. He has inside of him the materials and mechanisms to undergo a change. And you cannot tell from his outward appearance that he is destined to be clothed in radiant colors, to find a new home amongst the flowers and the clouds. That caterpillar is destined to fly. You know, an earthworm can travel. Earthworm can travel from one garden patch to the other. When the weather gets cold, it's said that an earthworm can burrow as deep as six feet in the ground to preserve its life. But the monarch butterfly travels 
In fact, the swarms of monarch butterflies that go from Mexico to Canada travel some 5,000 miles. Now, it takes them four generations to get there. But they're no longer the earthbound, wormish creature they once were. What is the name of the process of that transformation from caterpillar to butterfly? You know it. Metamorphosis. That is your Greek word here in Romans 12 too. It is a fantastic picture of the process that Paul has in mind. It details for us an inward change in fundamental character, desires, conduct, and purpose that works its way out into radiant expression. And again, this is a passive command. Be metamorphosed. Be progressively transformed. It it is also a present command. That is, it is an ongoing process. Unlike a caterpillar to butterfly, one-time change. This is an ongoing process of metamorphosis. And, And we are to yield to God's means of transformation. We could read this command, go on being metamorphosed. And as Bill Mounts has said, this is a radical reorientation that begins deep within the human heart in an ongoing process. Listen, think about the worms, the old worm friends of that caterpillar. And they're saying to that guy, hey, let's do some worm stuff. Remember? Remember what we used to do? And they're offended at the caterpillar's skyward gaze. They're offended at his chrysalis, that pod, the cocoon in which he transforms. He has no idea what wings are for, that old worm friend. And then he can't stand those brilliant colors. Come back down here and do worm stuff with us, he cries. Do you feel that pressure? That is the pressure every day of the world that used to know you the world that used to be you seeks to have on you yet, Christian. Listen to Paul's words in Colossians 3. You have died. That old you, eating dirt, died. And your life, the real you, the new you, That life is, listen, hidden with Christ in God. You you didn't change physical form yet. But your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Christian, that day is coming. But even before that day, do you understand present tense? Your life is is hidden. Who you really are, what you really will be, your priorities, your passions, your loves, all of that is obscured in the world's eyes. They can't see who you are. And in the meantime, the Christian's true identity is emerging, manifesting itself in flesh and blood in what we call progressive sanctification. You will look different. You will act different. Who is doing this transformation? Is this bootstrap morality? Find some things to fix in your life and just keep tweaking and try to make it better and better? No. (laughs) As you and I yield ourselves to God and his means, as we seek to humbly obey him in his word, who is doing this transformation? This is the Lord, the Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of Jesus are being transformed into that same image from one glory to another, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And how does he do this? How does the Holy Spirit do this according to Romans 12, 2? Notice, by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. This is brainwashing in a good sense. This is God's process of transforming us from the inside out. And it's not mystical and mysterious and go sit on a mountain with a guru and empty your brain. No, this is fill your brain. This is fill your mind with that which is new, 
contrast to that which you used to be and that which was old and that which is exerting external pressure on you. This is think different. How important the mind is to true Christian worship. Do not hit eject on your brain. But think Have your mind renewed? Learn to think God's thoughts after him. Friends, check your inputs. Check your inputs. What's coming in? Is the world squeezing you into its mold? Are you letting the world in? Think about your entertainments. Think about news and opinions. Think about worldview that comes in from every corner, by osmosis, by the people we hang out with, by intentional injection of godless worldview through inputs. Do you have an unfiltered approach to media, social media? Hey, whatever just happens to show up on this page is what goes into my brain. Does Satan know us? Does Satan know ways in which we are vulnerable? Does does he know how to employ the resources of this present age to affect Christians? I think he does. If you're in the habit of just randomly allowing things in, Christian, this is a prohibition against such things. We need to check our inputs. We need to give serious thought. And on the positive side, we need regular, disciplined time in God's Word. Where do we get our mind renewed? From the truth of God. And the truth of God has a number of vehicles that we need to rethink about. Think about your time in the Word. Disciplined, regular Bible reading. Is that a part of your life? Is it a great, big part of your life? 24 hours in a day. Do you brush your teeth more than you read your Bible? What would it look like to have my mind renewed? God, what are the dirty thoughts? Where do they need to be washed? God, what are the old thoughts? Where do they need to be renewed? God, what is wrong with my thinking that needs to be made right? And how will I go about doing that? Friends, read your Bible. A lot. Often. Again. 168 hours in a week. How many of those hours are you squozen? That's not really the past participle. But it rhymes with frozen if you want to say, how has your thought life been frozen, not renewed? Listen, the Word of God is actually in competition with your schedule. The Word of God is in competition with the world, actively seeking to squeeze you into its mold. The Word of God is in competition with your thought life. The Word of God is in competition every day, every week. Give it some room. Make plans. Cut things out. Put the Bible in. Listen to the Word taught. Listen to the Word preached. Meditate on God's word. That means slow down and think about it. Biblical meditation is not empty your mind. Biblical meditation is fill your mind and let it marinate, soak, infiltrate every corner. Memorize scripture. Seek out friends who are saturated with the word of God. Those are your best friends in life. The people who just bleed Bible when you cut them. What does a trial do in someone's life? Does scripture come out? I want that one for a friend. And then go be a friend with a word-saturated mind. Be discipled by good books. 
Again, read outside your century. Visit the book table. Don't just read whatever happens to come to you, whatever the latest cool Christian book is, whatever's handed out at a conference. Be thoughtful about this. What are the best disciplers in church history? Can one of those guys be my friend? Can one of those women be my friend? Can can I hear from them? Can, Can someone who, at the end of a faithful life, wrote down what they had learned, can I glean from that? Just my personal thought on this, the the latest, coolest, Christian, helpful book, let it sit for 20 years. If it's still good 20 years from now, maybe it'll be valuable. And if you're not a reader, I understand reading's hard. Reading becomes easy when you recognize, oh, that content is something I need. If you read 10 pages of quality discipleship per day, 10 pages, of quality discipleship per day. If my math is right, that's 3,654. No, what's a quarter? 3,652 and a half, right? 365 and a quarter days in a year. Pages, 3,600 pages in a year of people who have lived the Christian life well and want to disciple me. Those are good friends. And then share good books with living people. (laughs) Listen, if you've ever said, you know, I just don't see the Holy Spirit working in my life. I'm just stagnant in my Christian life. I'm a little bit listless and restless. I've had spurts of growth, but I've kind of plateaued. Have you ever felt that way? Romans 12, 1 and 2 is going to give us a little bit of a jump start. And specifically here in Romans 12, 2, here are two very specific things you can check today to get off the plateau, to, to, to stop the cruise control, and, and to see real growth in your life. Ask yourself this question, am I being squeezed, squozen? Identify some areas in which you have not participated in active resistance against the constant external pressure of the world on your life, where you've softened your resistance, you've been influenced by the world, making accommodation to the present evil age. Maybe there are uncrucified attractions to things that are temporal, or uncrucified attractions even to things that are sinful. Just recognize those things. Confess those things things, to see where you're being squeezed and to take up again that resistance will spark growth in your Christian life. And here's the second category. Am I being transformed? Am I being renewed? Am I putting myself under the faucet of God's grace? Am I putting myself under the reign of grace actively? Am I putting myself under truth Is my mind being renewed by the word of God through the various means and vehicles God has provided in my life? Bible reading, Bible listening, fellowship with believers, making good friends. And you will find a jump start in your Christian life. Learn things about God you haven't learned yet. Seek to put to death things you haven't put to death. Benefit from small groups. Be a benefit in small groups. Practice the one another's. Ask yourself, am I regularly having my thoughts recalibrated by God's truth? Am I having my heart reoriented by God's priorities? What will be the outcome if we do these things? The negative command and the positive command. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. The outcome is really promising, really exciting. Look at the last part of verse 2. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You're going to get clarity and insight into the will of the sovereign ruler of the universe. That's exciting. And it answers a critical question in the Christian life. How do I know God's will for my life? Have you ever asked that question or been asked that question? Listen, it's a critical question that comes from the right heartbeat. I'm not my own. 
I do not belong to myself. I am a slave of Christ. I'm a slave of righteousness. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm an ambassador for the king. I'm a son or a daughter of the sovereign of all things. So, God, what do you want? If your question about what is God's will for my life is about how can I please my Savior and my Lord, what a great question. And this text is one of several that so clearly answers that question for us. And I know we want answers to questions like, whom will I marry? Should I take this job opportunity? What shirt should I wear, right? We've boiled the question of God's will down to day-to-day decision-making and practical living, and and that's actually really important. My day-to-day decisions need to be surrendered to love for God and submitting to the Lordship of Christ. I want to be pleasing to Him. But something in us wants to make our practical affairs mystical, really special. Um, And maybe if we have unique, special, extra-biblical divine guidance for my daily decisions, that will elevate those daily decisions to the level of worship. Well, listen, Christian, you need to understand that you don't need mysticism to worship God in the selection of what shirt I'm going to wear, whom I'm going to date, what job I'm going to take, where will I go to college, when should I retire, or any of life's decisions. It is straight worship all the time. You are a living sacrifice. That's what we saw last week. What does it mean to know his will? (laughs) To, To look for some extra biblical, special divine guidance for daily decisions totally misses the point about how God wants us to know his will. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, By his divine power, he has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has granted to us. He's already given us everything we need for life and for godliness. To live the Christian life and to be pleasing to him, we have what we need. He's promised that. He has revealed to us his will. He's given it to us in his word. And we are to yield to his clear instructions about finding his will. Listen, decision-making in the Christian life is not some mystifying process of reading almost imperceptible signs or of straining our spiritual ears for some not quite audible impression from God. The discovery of God's will for my life, not only for the whole direction and pattern of my daily living, but for any particular decision to be made, is right here in these two verses. You be a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. Don't be conformed. Go on being transformed, and then you will know. Then you will know that as we drag the whole walking carcass of our lives up to the altar of living dedication to God, we quit being squeezed into what we are not. We go on being recalibrated and reoriented in our thinking by God's word. Resistance to the world and yieldedness to God is God's will for your life. That is God's will for your life. And you cannot know God's will for your life if you are squozen or frozen. Resistance to the world, yieldedness to God. And notice what Paul says about this, so that you may prove what the will of God is. Now, this word prove might make it sound like we're putting God to the test in some way. This is a word for testing. It delineates for us a testing process that actually demonstrates the intrinsic quality of something. We're going to find out in a moment that God's will is good and pleasing and perfect. How will we discover that for ourselves? This word for testing, and and some of your English Bible translations actually use two words for this one Greek word, test and approve. And I think that's appropriate. It it captures this word that was used in the world of metallurgy. You you heat up a precious metal so that the impurities rise to the top. It does two things. It reveals the quality of the metal, and it also removes the impurities. It, It tests, and the testing process actually produces the genuine result. This word was also used in the, in the realm of the Roman soldier, specifically the elite Roman soldier, kind of like the, the Navy SEALs or the Green Berets of the ancient world. Those who were tested and found at the highest caliber and level to be the elite soldier, the testing process 
proved the metal of the soldier. That is the word that is used here. And this is not like we're putting God to the test as if there are impurities that need to be come out of his will. But it is the ongoing process of discovery in our life of how intrinsically excellent the will of God actually is. When your life is surrendered to him and you're in active resistance to the external pressure of the world and you are in the ongoing process of being transformed by the renewing of your mind, you will discover something. The proven quality of that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's morally good. It meets God's standards and it attains its intended aim. That's the will of God. How do I know God's will for my life? Well, you can't if your life is world-shaped and you're living under old thinking. An unrenewed mind cannot discern the will of God. You need to understand that the Christian life is the life of a citizenship of heaven, governed by heaven's priorities, being transformed and brought into ever-progressive conformity to Christ. And yet we also know from Jesus' words that he prayed for his disciples that they would not be of this world, but he also recognized he wasn't asking to take them out of it. That's significant. Christians through church history have tried at various times the hermit thing, the cloister thing, the monastery experiment. Number one, it doesn't work because you take yourself with you and your heart's got enough sin to just make that monastery a place of sin. It's not a retreat from sin because you took you there. And the cloistered environment is not what God intended for his ambassadors who make it their ambition to be pleasing to him and to beg the world on behalf of Christ be reconciled to him. And the reason we're still on this earth as Christians is to make the excellencies of his glory in the gospel known to a world that desperately needs it. So don't hear a a message about don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world and go create a holy huddle Christian cloister avoidance of everybody walking the earth who doesn't name Christ. That is not why you're here. But you resist the conformity to that world, stick out like a sore thumb and actually be a walking trophy of God's grace and a billboard for the transforming power of the reign of grace through the gospel. That's the Christian life. That is God's will for your life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these words. So simple, so clear, so convicting. We feel it, oh God. We feel the the world around us squeezing at every side and we feel the ally of the world in us, that residual sin still in my heart that kind of likes it. God, forgive us for not resisting in the ways that we should. Help us to see where we still are not resisting. Forgive us, Lord, for not yielding ourselves to your renewal process of transformation. And let us evermore be yielded to you in humble faith, God, we pray for this church and ask that these verses would mark our lives and our community together, that a watching world might see the transforming power of the gospel and run to you. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.